it's time to get started again. First of all, let me say to anyone who doesn't know me at all, uh, or barely knows me, uh, welcome. Um, I suppose I could do a kind of virtual handshake to you, hello. Um, but also to all of those uh, who know me well, and those of you who, who have many memories of this building where I am, the railway mission, you've been here many times, you've drank hot drinks here, you've eaten nice cakes and things here, maybe you've shed a few tears here, you've had uh, good conversations with people you're close to, you've sang here and prayed here and so on and so forth. And uh, today it's just me here. But anyway, uh, when we used to meet here, and God willing we'll meet here again, um, in all our meetings we've tended to say things like this in prayer. We've asked God that our focus will be on him rather than where we are, rather than one another, rather than anything human and passing and temporary that our focus would be on God. And so, yes, welcome again, but may God help us to focus on him for this opportunity of time we have to do that. And I invite you to pray with me now. Let us pray. Lord our God in heaven, we worship you and we pray for your blessing upon this video service. We pray, Lord God, that the content of this, in terms of a Bible reading, things uh, explained and applied from the Bible, prayers and hymns, that this content will have your blessing upon it. And we pray, Lord, that you will help us indeed to focus upon you. We pray that you will speak and help us to listen. We pray, Lord God, for every person who watches this, that it will be a coming to know God more. Lord, make us to know you well, we pray. And so I, at the beginning, I did a a jokey handshake to introduce myself. But Lord, may you introduce yourself. May you make yourself known to those who do not yet know you, we pray. And may you come to us who do and make us know you better. Father, we reach out to you. We pray, Lord, you are the one who can help us. You are the one who is stable. You are the one who is not taken by surprise. You are the one who is working out your plan and there is no accident with you oh lord god we thank you that we can rest in that there are no accidents with god and his ways and his plans and purposes no accidents at all our god is greatly infinitely wise and so lord we pray that it may be you who we become more familiar with who we get to know better and who we worship and love, and adore, and trust, and rest in. We pray for your blessing now, in Jesus' name. Amen. There's going to be a hymn now then. You, you'll remember, those of you Norwich Evangelical Free Church people, of, about the idea of a focus hymn, a kind of hymn of the month, hymn of the season, and uh, we've done a few of those, and there was a hymn that I had in mind to do, and uh, we never did, perhaps we will, but it's this hymn that will come up now.
Now a Bible reading then. If you have your Bible there to hands, then please do follow Lamentations chapter 5 and just now the first 15 verses. Lamentations 5, just the first 15 verses because the remainder of the chapter after verse 15, which brings in some new thoughts, is something that we will save for another meeting. But Lamentations 5 from verse 1. Remember, O Lord, what has come upon us. Look and behold our reproach. Our inheritance has been turned over to aliens and our houses to foreigners. We have become orphans and waifs. Our mothers are like widows. We pay for the water we drink. And our wood comes at a price. They pursue at our heels. We labour and have no rest. We have given our hands to the Egyptians and the Assyrians to be satisfied with bread. Our fathers sinned and are no more, but we bear their iniquities. Servants rule over us. There is none to deliver us from their hand. We get our bread at the risk of our lives because of the sword in the wilderness. Our skin is hot as an oven because of the fever of famine. They ravished the women in Zion, the maidens in the cities of Judah. Princes were hung up by their hands, and elders were not respected. Young men ground at the millstones. Boys staggered under loads of wood. The elders have ceased gathering at the gate, and the young men from their music. The joy of our heart has ceased. Our dance has turned into mourning. There will be helpful things for us, I'm sure, in those words. Another hymn, though, before we come back to them. The hymn this time is Far Off, I See the Goal, O Saviour, Guide Me. Uh, this is our last hymn as such in this service. We, after the sermon, I'm going to have a, a song, uh, and it's uh, you'll see a friend of mine, um, not a close friend, but a friend of mine, Nathan Hayward, uh, playing and singing a song he has written. And it's based on, I think, the words Jehovah Shammah, the Lord is there, God is there, uh, from the, those Jehovah Shammah is in Ezekiel 48, and it will go quite well with uh, the sermon. I'm at the moment restricted in the number of hymns and songs that I've sought permission and obtained permission to use, but that's one that I think will go well. That'll be later. Now we'll have uh, the hymn recorded at the Aberystwyth Conference, Far Off I See the Goal.
can you picture long ago a 70 year old prophet in chains in prison but being released and strangely enough now being given a choice when the rest of his countrymen aren't given a choice the rest of his countrymen are either being told they must stay where they are or they must come away in captivity to Babylon but this prophet is given a choice by the Babylonians if it seems good to you come to Babylon if it seems good to you stay it's Jeremiah these things are recorded in Jeremiah chapter 40 his choice is to stay to stay in the vicinity of Jerusalem Jeremiah loved Jerusalem we know that from the scriptures according to Jewish tradition Jeremiah wanted to stay and he wanted to preserve the memories of the Jerusalem that had been before the great tragedy that had just happened, before the Babylonians destroyed it. He wanted to preserve the memories of the past. He wanted people to learn from what had happened and think about it. That's Jewish tradition, but it fits perfectly well with what the Bible tells us. And so Jeremiah stays when many, many are are taken away into Babylon. He stays with the rest of the people who are still there. And he writes the book of Lamentations. He writes about the intense suffering of the capture of Jerusalem. All the hunger that happened in the siege. People dying of hunger. He writes about that in this poetry form in the book of Lamentations. Here in chapter 5, he's nearly finished. This is his last poem, Lamentations chapter 5. Well, he's thinking about the, the current time now then. The siege is over. The fires have gone out. But where are we now? Where are we now? That's what he's thinking about, it seems, in Lamentations chapter 5, the last chapter of the book. I suppose we could relate that to us at the moment, this country and several other countries. So we can look back on the great wave of cases of COVID-19, the peak kind of figures of deaths each day, we're past that wave. Some things are being uh, released, uh, 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 some things are being uh, uh, dropped a little bit in the restrictions on the lockdown. We're over the peak. But are we back to normal? We we want to be back to normal. It would be lovely to think we were back to normal, but are we back to normal? Let's think, where are we now? I said, that's, that's the kind of thing that Jeremiah is doing in a very different period of history, in very different circumstances. But after Nebuchadnezzar's attack, after the capture of the city, where are we now? Now, you shouldn't believe everything that you read on Wikipedia. On Wikipedia, we can find these words about the book of Lamentations in the Bible. Lamentations has traditionally been ascribed to Jeremiah. And it gives a reason for that. Why? It says, probably on the grounds of the reference in 2 Chronicles 35, 25, to the prophet composing a lament on the death of King Josiah. But, it says, there is no reference to Josiah in the book of Lamentations, And no reason to connect it to Jeremiah. Now, I have read a fair bit about the book of of Lamentations, sorry, book of Lamentations. And I've I've read um, many good reasons for connecting it to the book of, to, to the prophet Jeremiah. 
And not one of the, the scholars that I've read on, on this have used 2 Chronicles 35, 25 and the reference to the lament about King Josiah as a reason for linking lamentations with Jeremiah. So you can't believe everything you read on Wikipedia. And I think, uh, I think there are many good reasons to, uh, to see the thoughts and the experiences of Jeremiah, what we know about that, in the book of Lamentations, that it is, that it is his words. Uh, I think that we can derive a lot of benefit from assuming that that is the case, even if we're not absolutely 100% sure. So yes, here in Lamentations chapter 5, he's saying, where are we now then? Some of us are still alive. Uh, some of, sorry, some of us are still around here in Jerusalem and in the vicinity of Jerusalem. Uh, some of us are scattered around. Many of us are in Babylon. And, uh, and we're the ones who've survived it. But where are we now? And this chapter is an example of being honest, being honest about where we are now, and being honest in the presence of God. No spin put on the situation, no glossing over certain things, being honest. And being honest in the presence of God. This is honest religion, honest prayer. Well, I want to encourage us all to be honest about certain things as we look at this honest prayer. It is all a prayer. It starts, remember, O oh Lord, O oh Jehovah, Yahweh. And it finishes uh, with a verse with, or verses with the word you in. It's all a prayer. Here is one encouragement to us. Let us be honest about loss so let, may we be encouraged to be honest about loss by this chapter Lamentations 5 how does it start well verse 2 our inheritance has been turned over to aliens and our houses to foreigners we have become Orphans and waifs, our mothers are like widows. We have known loss. The loss of our land, the loss of our homes, and worse than that for many of us, the loss of our dads, our fathers, have been killed. Now I'm sure that some of you that I'm speaking to now today have a painful sense of loss. You can look back at what you once had and don't have any more, whether it's a life you once had, a certain aspect of your life that you once had that don't, you don't have any more, you've lost it. Someone you loved. And suddenly or gradually... It's not yours anymore, or that person isn't yours anymore. Something or someone you've lost. And you're not alone, if that's you. you. You are not alone. Every day, there are people who lose their livelihoods, their jobs, their health, their parents. Children, siblings, partners. Many can think about uh, Jeremiah and his people and would be able to read words like these and relate to them. As he says, we, we, our inheritance and our houses, so things that really meant most to us, are, are Greatest possessions, most precious. And our fathers 
lost. We're like orphans. The context in as, as these words are written is prayer, isn't it? The context is we're coming to you, Lord God, our great God, oh Lord. We're coming to you, we're reaching out to you in our prayers and we're not pretending, we're confessing how things are with us and what we've lost. And we're reaching out, Lord God, for your understanding, your care, your presence with us. Remember us, Lord God, remember. Look down upon us, we're reaching up. Uh, with our with our loss who encourages us to pray like that who gives us the encouragement to pray like that well one thing we can say is even if this book of lamentations was not written by jeremiah we can know one thing that first and foremost it's given by god it comes from the thought of god as part of his word the bible it is God who encourages us to pray in this way, to come freely to speak to him, to lay our hearts open, to pray honestly, including to pray honestly about our sad, sad uh, losses, to pray about what we've lost, and to seek God's understanding, God's presence with us, in our mourning. It's true also for something not obvious that is lost here, and that is a, a loss of dignity. A loss of dignity. This is humiliating for us. Uh, that comes across, if you look carefully at the words, so our inheritance has been turned over. We've lost our inheritance, but it's been turned over to, to aliens, to to foreigners, or houses to foreigners. And in the Jewish mindset, we've lost our dignity in this. We've lost our honour in this. Our inheritance is in the hands of Gentiles, those who are outside of the covenant of God. Verse 4, we pay for the water we drink and our wood comes at a price we might read that and think well I pay my water bill as well but it it, it means water we shouldn't have to pay for uh, and uh, wood we shouldn't have to pay for it should be there in our lands for us to freely go and retrieve but we pay for it this is this is humiliating we've lost our dignity in this and other things in this chapter show that as well And that can be a thing for us, the loss of a sense of dignity. I, you may have, be thinking, like it came to my mind, of some experiences in old age sometimes. It can be difficult things in old age where independence is lost, other people are relied upon, you're a burden to others. Um, help needs to be had with even washing and things like that, a loss of dignity. Or a, a sense of humiliation because of some perceived failure that we're going through. And others start to find out about it. And it's hard. Well, it is hard to, to go through what could be called the valley of humiliation. That's a hard experience. That's a trial, a testing time. And it's something, again, to come to God about, to lay our hearts open. We can tell him, we can tell him things as they are. We can tell him what we're going through. We can tell him how hard it is. We can tell him the things that we've lost, that once we had, and we wish we still had them, but we don't. Secondly, let us be honest about our fragile self-esteem. This then is a similar point to the loss of dignity. In Lamentations chapter 1, Jerusalem is described as a princess, someone with splendour, 
someone who is a princess among the provinces. She has a good name amongst all the nations round about. She's respected, she's seen in her splendour. But now everything has changed. Everything has changed. And uh, yes, our inheritance turned over to aliens, our houses to foreigners. We pay for the water we drink. Our wood comes at a price. Verse, verse 6, we have given our hands to the Egyptians and to the Assyrians to be satisfied with bread. We, we need to seek help and go into alliances with those who were once our enemies, who we were rescued from. Uh, verse 8, servants rule over us. The people who are ruling over us uh, are seen by others, or perhaps it means would have in the past been seen by us as servants, and yet they're rulers here. They rule over us. We're really at the bottom. And uh, verse 12, uh, looking back, princes were hung up by their hands, elders were not respected. Our, our princes, they... Uh, they, they hanged them uh, and humiliated them in the way they hanged them. A terrible way to end their lives. And the elders were not respected. Now, being humiliated, suffering a kind of reproach is never easy. But the more that we make of other people, other people's view on us, the more we kind of live off our own reputation and how we seem to others, what they think and say about us, the harder it is. Jerusalem and Judah was once like a princess then. It once had respect from others. But the, the people, the Jewish people, made too much of what other people thought because they didn't make enough about what God thought of them. They forgot these words, which are in the Bible and were well known to them. In 1 Samuel 16, the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Jeremiah's generation had forgotten that. And because they didn't care, they, they had become uncaring about their real standing before God, how God really saw them. And they, and they cared too much about how other people saw them. And now they've lost the respect of others. But the more we care about how other people see us, the more we give weight to that, as if that mattered most, the more our self-esteem will be fragile. We'll be affected by how, in how we feel about ourselves, by what others are saying, what they're thinking. And that can be knocked. I have to come to God and confess, not infrequently, confess that I'm too affected by what other people think, by what other people say. I've been giving too much weight to that. I've been forgetting God looks at my heart, and that is what matters, what he sees. I forget that. And then I become prone to being swayed about too much by little things. I think, I think I'm not alone. I think there's many people who are swayed too much in how we feel about ourselves, and sometimes in the decisions that we make. By what others say, by what others think, maybe we're swayed too much or we're affected too much by little things like, how many likes have I got for this? Oh, are there any more yet? I think just things like that. What do people think of this picture of me? Things like that. The Lord looks on the heart. But let us be honest with God. Let us come to him and tell him what we're like. We do have fragile self-esteem, perhaps. We, we are too affected. We have felt knocked by what people have said. 
He understands us. And we can confess not remembering enough that it's his view of us that matters. It's his eyes on us that are the important ones. It's his verdict of us that, that, that matters and nothing else does in comparison. But we can confess we forget that. And we can, we can honestly come to God about everything to do with ourselves and our self-esteem and our experiences with what others, how others are viewing us and how we appear on the, on the ladder. Are we near the top or are we near the bottom? And it's not very nice to feel near the bottom when it wasn't very nice for Jeremiah and his generation to now feel at the bottom. But they're coming to God and they're saying, remember us, Lord, this is what it's like. And coming over in the words is, this is how we feel. This is how we feel. And woe to us, we have sinned. We are confessing a, a moral failure in this. But Lord, this is how it is. Remember us in your mercy. We are reaching out to you. So we have thought uh, this. Let us be honest about loss. Let us be honest about fragile self-esteem. And I would add this too. Let us be honest about weakness, sadness and suffering. There's overlap with the points here, but to focus on these things. Weakness, sadness and suffering. The people feel weak. They're in a strange position. The strange position of uh, the simple things of life now having restrictions upon them. Things like going to collect water then, and going to collect wood. And uh, these things are being charged for in new ways. People's eyes are upon us. The, the Babylonians are ruling over us in our own lands, and we mustn't step out of line. And the simple things of life now, we can't even have a freedom in. Does that sound familiar? The simple things of life, like, like going to visit mum and dad. Like having pizza with friends. Having coffee with friends. Just the freedom to go where you like. Being able to be close to others. Be able to meet as churches. Being able to be close to friends. Give people hugs. Very, very, I could add other things as well, couldn't I? Simple things, things we took for granted. And, and we can't do them. Or... We have to judge whether we're prepared to um, make an exception to what's being asked of us from government if we're going to do them and start to feel like rebels. And it makes us feel weak. It makes us feel weak. We feel weak because uh, we... We can't prevent the spread of infection. It's a tiny thing and yet it seems to be turning the world upside down. We feel very weak. And we feel weak because we find out perhaps how much we relied upon being able to do certain things, go to certain places, have a certain lifestyle. And now it's affecting our income, it's affecting our mental health. We feel weak. The people felt weak in Lamentations 5. Feeling weak can be a wake-up call. Feeling weak can mean we're actually getting close to reality and we're realising we are weak. We are weak. Take certain things away and then we're thrown. We are weak. We are limited. We are powerless before the influence of certain things. 
We can't conquer everything we would want to conquer. We are weak. And let us be honest with God that we are weak. Remember, O Lord, just to pray is an, uh, pray with the sense of need. To ask God, reach out for him, to ask for his care of us is an admission that without him we're weak. And then there's sadness and suffering. There can be a shadow cast over our hearts. A shadow cast by many things. Things in the past, things in the present, our own experiences or the experiences of other people we love that affect us. That's what you see in Lamentations 5. As, as Jeremiah writes this, there's all kinds of things casting a shadow over the people's hearts. There's distressing memories of people being chased for their lives. But the Babylonians are still intimidating. They're intimidating those who are left and they would chase them again if they stepped out of line. There's very little rest under their regime. That comes across in verse 5 and verse 13. There's distressing memories of the famine when the siege was going on. That's over, but still they have a shortage. There's no security. They're living at the risk of extreme poverty. There's no safety net for the impoverished. That comes over in verses 9 and 10. There's distressing memories of what the Babylonians did to our women, sexually abusing them. What they did to our princes and elders. And still they have authority over us in verses 8, 11 and 12. So there's this shadow over the people's hearts. And verse 15 says, the joy of our heart has ceased. Our dance has turned into mourning. The Bible says many good things about joy, wonderful things about joy, but the Bible is honest that there are times of mourning. There are times of darkness and sadness. Perhaps you're in a time of mourning and parts of the scripture like this can remind you of your sadness perhaps this passage makes you think of our own situation the, the greatest suffering in this world because of the coronavirus and our stumbling attempts to curtail the spread of it for me this passage reminded me of the deep sadness that millions and millions of people in this world feel day by day and to feel that sadness with them. How many people in this world are fleeing war and oppression? Do you know how many? Apparently 70 million. I'm just one person. I live in a family of four, going on five, I'm in a church, 20 members, and then there's 70 million people in this world fleeing war and oppression. Do you know how many people in this world are, are just staying put but having to put up with life under serious curtailing of their freedoms in oppressive lands? Apparently, Two and a half billion people in this world live in countries where freedoms are taken away and where there's oppression. How many orphaned children are there in this world? 153 million. I'm one person who wasn't orphaned. And there's 153 million that have been. And today... Nearly 6,000 new children will become orphaned. How many women in this world, at some point in their life, will or have experienced rape or physical sexual abuse? 
apparently it's nearly a billion. Now, of course, these figures can't be verified. Um, we shouldn't believe everything we read on the internet. I said that earlier. But even if these figures are doubled in exaggeration, even if you halve them, they would still reflect that this is a world where m many, many people suffer very badly. Let us be honest about sadness and suffering. And what about the sadness of Christian people, Christian people who pray for revival, Christian people who pray for certain others that they love to see saved and hope to see saved, and yet sometimes we can, we can ask ourselves, how many people are there who've heard of Jesus Christ, who are prayed for, and yet never come, never come to Christ, are never saved? How many backsliders are there in this world who go away from the God they once believed? How many churches have been closed in the 20 years of this century. And we can ask ourselves questions like this, and there can be a spiritual sadness. We can feel that unbelief, rejection of the Lord Jesus Christ, is getting bigger and bigger and bigger, like it's winning the day. Like the spiritual battle is being won by the world, the flesh and the devil and lost by the gospel. We can feel like that. And there's deliberate rejection of the saviour that we love, the Lord Jesus Christ, we love. The light of the world, the answer, the saviour, the one who there's so much about him to love and yet there's so much of a Rejection of him, a saying no to him, turning away from him. Well, we can say, remember, O Lord, in the words of this chapter, remember what sadness we feel about these things. We are in a broken, sad world where much suffering takes place. Strange things like here in this chapter, in this example. But we're in a broken world, <laughs> a world centuries later and still a sad broken world and yet in this sad world we're seeking to find joy lord in you and in your service and in seeing your name glorified and we're looking for fruit we're looking for fruit we're looking for your name to be glorified But all we seem to see is your name being trampled in the dust. Now, if we, if we say that all the time, we're missing out. We're, we, we've got, we're blind because we're not seeing things that are encouraging where God's name is glorified. But I'm just saying how we can sometimes feel. And I'm saying in some situations we go through, that is all we see. We just see disappointments and we see God's name blasphemed and we see God dishonoured and trampled in the dust. We see people raising their fists. We see people, well, we see much that grieves us, much that is an attack on truth, on Jesus Christ, on his goodness tender love and grace on his righteousness and we do have joy in the Lord we do have joy in Christ and who he is but we can be honest and say our joy is disturbed it is it is attacked and sometimes really truly disturbed by the disappointments and the evidence of, of sin Satan sorrow Remember, O oh Lord, we can say this honestly, we can bring to God 
our, our hearts, open them up. But we have a God who does more than remember us. Let us just finish with this. We have a God who does more than remember us. I've touched on this being a sad world. But we belong to this sad world. I look at my heart and my mind and I can understand why rape happens in this world. And people oppress others. I can understand that. Simply by looking at ugly seeds of sin in my heart and mind. I belong to this broken world. I'm part of it. We can all say this. But there was a very special man who lived. Joshua, or translated another way, Jesus, who didn't belong to this world, but chose to come into it. He is the eternal, everlasting God, the Son of the Father. And he didn't just look down from heaven and say, I remember you. I give you my love and care. He didn't just say that. He came into this world that he didn't belong to. It was made by him and then sin entered into it and it became a broken world. Separate from him. But he came into this world that he would suffer with us and that he would suffer for us. Amazing. He didn't just remember us he came. That's how close the Lord Jesus Christ is to us in our difficulties and loss, in our suffering and our sadness. And he says, if we take him at his word, that he will take, bring us ultimately out of this world that we belong to, into the world that he belongs to, to his home, to a far, far better place, a perfect place, and to himself. So we can be honest about loss, we can be honest about fragile self-esteem, we can be honest about weakness and sadness and suffering, but I'm glad that we can be honest about Jesus and we can be honest about hope. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you for your precious word and we pray that you will bless your word to us. Father, there's no use us not being honest when we pray, but help us not only to be honest, but to be open and to have liberty to be able to pour out our hearts before the Lord. Uh, Lord, to be able to have flowing words from us to God above, our great God. Lord, remember us, we pray. Each one of us, we pray from our own individual hearts. Remember me and help and bless. But thank you that there is a hope that we have in Jesus Christ and what he's done and how close he came to us. And how close he is to us. There is a hope because of his promises and the success of his suffering on the cross for us. That we will be brought out of this world, this broken world. Indeed, your people already do not belong to this world anymore, but belong to the world above. And we thank you for the hope of eternal rest. God, wiping away all tears from our eyes. The hope we have of eternal joy. The hope we have of there being no more death. No, no more weeping. No more night. And Lord, it, 
everything that is what we were made for, that our hearts long for. We thank you for this. We pray that you will bless us in your truth now and be with each of your people in Christ's name. Amen. share some words from you that came into my mind this week from a hymn I haven't sung for ages for years and then just pray for a little while longer the words are this be our joyful song today Jesus only Jesus he who takes our sins away Jesus only Jesus name with every blessing rife be our joy and hope through life. Be our strength in every strife. Jesus, only Jesus. Be our trust through years to come. Jesus, only Jesus. Password to our heavenly home. Jesus, only Jesus. When from sin and sorrow free, on through all eternity, this our theme and song shall be. Jesus, only Jesus. Lord God, we ask you to, whatever 
else we have or do not have. We pray that we might be rich in Jesus Christ and know that we have him. Lord Jesus, draw near to us and help us to be near to you. Jesus, only Jesus. We thank you, O God, that we can be encouraged not to despair because you are there and you are here. You are the God who is not distant, the God who is found by all those who reach out for you. We pray, Lord God, for Christian people persecuted in other countries. We pray for Christians who are persecuted in a new way recently, in that they have become in, in need of government help. We are, think about uh, labourers on a day wage who have not been able to work because of lockdown in different countries and have needed government help, and yet the government help has just been given in an unfair way, and there's been discrimination. And we pray for Christians who have lost out because of that and who are particularly needy. Help others of your people who are able to, to help them to be uh, distributing food and necessities, we pray. But we pray for all persecuted people around this world. There's many in Africa. There's many in Asia and the Middle East, and there's many in other continents as well. And we pray for Christian people persecuted, Lord, suffering heavily. And they would be able to escape that suffering perhaps by denouncing the name of Christ. And we pray that you will help them. Help them to know that the Lord honours those who honour him and be with them in their suffering, we pray. Give them strength. Give them endurance, give them comfort, give them joy, we pray. We pray, Lord, for one another and for people in our own lands. We pray for the um, difficulties of the time we're in. We pray for people who are lonely this time. Lord, we pray for everyone who lives on their own and is struggling with that at the moment with the restrictions upon them. We pray for people who are unsettled and uh, affected in a state of mind and well-being by what's going on. Lord, you are the one who is able to uh, refresh and restore. Uh, we pray that people may come to your word and come to you and uh, be refreshed and restored. Lord, we pray that you will help us to, to be wise and to realise things we can go, do to help ourselves. Uh, with, with just lifestyle decisions and things like that, little things that could help. Lord, be giving wisdom, we pray, and provision for us. But, but yes, most of all, help us to draw near to yourself and find refreshment and help and restoration from you, we pray. We pray for people who are fearful. Lord, give calmness and assurance. We pray for people who are mourning, Oh Lord, do help, we pray. And we pray for loved ones who we cannot uh, be close to, but you can. And we pray that you will be near to them. We pray for keeping and protection, Lord. Protect the vulnerable, we pray. Uh, those who are taking risks uh, of, of in, uh, getting infected, we pray for your protection. We pray for healing for those perhaps we know who are unwell. Lord, we pray for our governments. We pray that your will will be worked out through them. We pray for wisdom for them. And we pray for members of our government and similar uh, um, bodies, similar organisations who are very influential and uh, important at this time. For, for people in high places to be brought to their knees before God, to be brought spiritually to a low place so that they confess they need the Lord, repent of sin and come to know Christ and be saved. Have mercy, Lord God, and do these things. Revive your work, we pray. 
I have been speaking about an honest sadness at a, the days of small things and the, the success of anti-Christian things. And we pray, Lord God, that, that what I've shared in terms of that sadness, even in our generation, may not be the final story. But, Lord, the, the times that we live in may be followed before long by times when clearly God is at work in, in quite remarkable and powerful ways. Lord, we pray that that will be the case. Breath of life, come sweeping through us, we pray. Lord, revive us, we pray. Revive your work, O oh Lord. Your mighty arm make bare. Speak with the voice that wakes the dead. And make your people hear. Make many people hear. We pray. Turn people to God. Turn people to their creator. Turn people to wisdom, bring people to their spiritual senses, bring people to Christ and salvation, bring people to the Bible and the truth, to honesty, integrity, truthfulness, love, forgiveness, faithfulness, self-denial, and putting Christ first, bring people to worship, not man's creations, not man's ideas. Bring people to worship the Lord God, we pray. Bless those who we know who are, and people in our own families who are unsaved. We pray, Lord, that our prayers may go on for them. Our love may be real uh, for them. And that uh, we may be able to one day love them as bro a brother or a sister in Christ. Lord, answer prayer. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore.